um, introduction to Neuronext. Uh, please welcome Mike Craig. Hello. How's it going? Um, cool. So uh, as you said, I'm Mike Craig. I'm a data scientist at Warby Parker here in New York. And um, this is introduction to neural networks with TensorFlow. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of split my talk half between in introducing like the concepts behind neural networks and how they work and then diving into the code so you can actually like use this stuff. Um, but I didn't want to make any assumptions about what, what people know. So I'm going to have like a really just kind of a high level um, overview of, of like machine learning and then the problem, and, but really with a focus on how to set up these problems um, operationally. So uh, what is machine learning? Machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence that deals with pattern recognition and um, um, you know, pr predictions and forecastings and things like that. Um, it's much more statistical than, than traditional artificial intelligence um, algorithms. I mean, when you, when you think about like Minimax or, or A star, these are kind of like heuristical um, algorithms to, to, to kind of pick like an optimal action. Whereas machine learning is a little more fuzzy. It's a little more like uh, statistical and using the uh, using data to kind of get at um, an, an approximation of what the optimal solution could be. And so that's kind of one way to think about it really is, is that you're, all, all the machine learning is just kind of like function approximation. And um, so basically any, any function that is that is computable and um, where, the f where the form isn't really that obvious, um, machine learning would be a good candidate. So here's a couple examples, um, like handwriting recognition. So I mean, you know, humans could look at that and, and I could, you know, 504192, but how do you tell the com uh, computer to, um, you know, encode these? Like for, for example, this, this, uh, this one right here is, is slightly tilted, whereas this one is, is not as much. And all these like very fuzzy differences cause, um, it's, you're gonna have this crazy rule set if you wanted to try to um, program it normally. Um, facial recognition is another thing. So if you like, let's say you had a facial recognition app on your phone and you've also like never taken a US history course or something, um, you could, uh, put you know you you could put that image through the facial recognition and and it would like use machine learning to kind of find the face in the image and like find all the different uh, key um, interesting points about that face and then like look it up in the database and everything and it'll tell you that it's George Washington and that you're an idiot for not knowing that. <laughs> uh, speech recognition so like Siri Google Now um, Amazon Echo right um, taking like audio signals and turning them into um, human, you know, human words um, is, is something that takes a lot of uh, machine learning. Also, the, I guess the other half of that too, like taking uh, natural language processing and taking um, words um, as, as we speak them and like turn them into something that's like more structured and useful for, uh, for a computer to understand. Uh, and the last example, so knowledge discovery. So this is this is something that maybe it made the rounds on the internet uh, six months ago. Maybe you've seen it, but uh, the, it's this the, somebody created this neural net that um, you give two images and it kind of learns the artistic style of the images and can kind of like combine them and draw the draw the image in the style of that other image. Um, and they use like you know um, uh, convolutional neural networks to do this, which we're 100% not going to get into in this 25 minute talk, but um, it, just some just some kind of examples of what you can do with this stuff. So um, really high level. Get, I'm going I'm to get more more uh, formalized get a more formalized uh, definition of, of the machine learning problem. So there are two main types of machine learning: um, supervised and unsupervised. And we're going to deal with supervised, and that's basically you have you collect data. Um, you have an input data that kind of describes all the information for a particular data point that you um, that, you, that you're observing, and then what the observed label for that is. So, for example, handwriting recognition, you uh, you could have the input would be the pixels in the image, and then the output would be like you know it was a, it was a one, it was a two. Um, and versus unsupervised learning, which is you don't you only have inputs, and you're kind of just saying okay, give me w the objective is to find patterns, and like give me give me this like what kind of clusters do you see? What kind of like hierarchies do you see in the data? Um, but we're gonna we're gonna deal with supervised learning in this talk. Um, 
So a little bit more formally, like this is basically how you want to structure your your supervised learning problem. You want to you want to collect these 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 input and these output matrices like this, um, where each row is like an observation of something that you uh, see, and then each uh, column is just like the different variables, the different pieces of information um, about that about that point. So. Um, like I said, uh, for, for handwriting recognition, one row could be an, an image, and then it, it's just like sort of flattened out, and then each column is like all the different pixels um, in the image. Um, and similarly, uh, your, out, your output is also a matrix. Typically, like in, in many cases, they're just kind of uh, one column, but you can have you know, more than one column in your output. And, um, and, and so for example, um, uh, let's see. Yeah. So, for example, with um, with with handwriting recognition, what you would have is you you might have um, ten uh, ten columns of outputs that are all binary, whether like zero or one, whether that particular image was a two or that particular image was a three, um, and so on and so forth. And um, so so that's kind of that's kind of how you want to. Th this is like the prerequisite before you even throw any algorithm at this. You want to be able to collect this type of data about um, about your problem. So this, too big. Um, let's get into neural networks then. Okay. So this is this is what a neural network looks like. Um, you basically have all these input nodes, and they sort of propagate through the network to to, to produce these outputs. Um, and these these the inputs uh, as are defined by that like x matrix right and so that's that gets fed in and um, goes through the network through these like arrows these these connection weights um, these arrows to the next layer of units and then those those units are activated in a certain way and then they move on to the next layer and so on and so forth and so some of the terminology for this. Um, yeah, I think I have it. I said it already, right? So neurons are activated at some level, which is then propagated forward through the different layers, um, and then the strength of this activation is controlled by these arrows, these connection weights, um, which is going to be what we're going to try to train during this process. Um, and so, in fact, you can kind of you can kind of see that um, each so each uh, the weights between each layers can be described as a matrix. Um, in between, so there's, there would be like a weight matrix here, and there'd be a weight matrix here, and these are the these are the matrices that we're trying to like optimize um, to to have the the uh, network learn something useful. Um, so, and then one other thing is that after after um, after the connection weights and the inputs are, are fed forward into this next uh, into the next layer, the unit is passed through what's called an activation function, um, which I'll which I'll describe in a second, but. Um, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll describe it in a second. <laughs> so this is, this more formally, this is how the uh, neuron's computation is. So um, if I have some unit Z, and uh, it's going to be a function of the previous layer's um, inputs multiplied by this weight and then passed through this um, activation function. And then, th and then, so then this would then be the input into the next layers and so on and so forth. Um, so what are these activation functions? Well, basically, it allows you, activation function allows you to kind of um, create this like nonlinear uh, relationship between, um, or it allows you like to, to define these nonlinear relationships between your input and your output. Um, if, if, we didn't, if we didn't have, uh, so if we didn't have an activation function, just, just by looking at this equation right here, it would, it would just be like without that F right there, and it would just, it would just say that each unit in, in the layer is just a function of the inputs multiplied by some weight. And then, and so if that's the case here, then this would be a, a, a function of this input multiplied by this weight. So this is a linear function of a linear function which is a linear function. So there would actually be no point in having this like middle layer at all if we didn't have this um, activation function. So all that being said, you could have a linear activation function if you wanted, um, but that totally defeats, defeats the purpose. I mean, sometimes you, you could have a, you can put a linear activation function at the last layer, at the output layer. Um, but uh, yeah, so but again, you you would lose that nonlinear relationship there. Another choice for an activation function is a sigmoid. 
kind of looks like this. Uh, so it, it, they're known as like squashing functions because they take um, the entire domain from negative infinity to infinity and kind of squash it onto this um, zero to one range here. Um, and this is kind of this is used a lot because um, it can kind of like very hand wavy be interpreted as probabilities. Um, and so you, you might want to like just throw uh, a sigmoid activation function at, at the end at the, like the, the output layer. And then if you uh, were classifying something and it came out with an output of like 0.7, you could sort of say, you can kind of say that, yeah, we're like it, the, the network is 70% sure that this is um, the case. Uh, another uh, possible, another um, a choice is a, a hyperbolic tangent, which is, as you can see, it kind of looks similar to sigmoid, and maybe it's a little bit steeper, but it goes from negative one to one uh, rather than zero to one. And this is kind of um, sometimes preferred in, in like some of the hidden layers because it's symmetric around zero. And so with the sigmoid, there's like this kind of this inherent bias where, I mean, it's symmetric around 0.5, right? And, um, and, and a lot of the math just works out, works out better if you make, make the assumption that a lot of these are just like um, normally distributed and, and, and symmetric around um, some, it's symmetric around zero. Um, another choice that is um, popular nowadays is the rectified linear unit. It, is, it looks like a linear unit from zero on, and then it's, and then it's um, there's like that nonlinearity at zero, and it's just, basically it's literally defined as the max of zero and x. Um, and this allows for the express, like a lot of the expressive power that you get from a, a linear uh, unit. I mean, you, it, it, we're not squashing anything and, and, and it can go up to infinity here, but it also has uh, this nonlinearity allows it to not just be like a linear function of a linear function. Um, also, it has a nice property that um, it actually is zero for, for any activations less than less than zero, right? So um, you can you can kind of think of it as it it has a, it's a way of like turning off a neuron, um, and there there would be there like um, yeah. So so you can you can have um, some neurons that that maybe just aren't um, it receives some input and it's not and it's deemed not that useful and it's kind of just like turned off, um, so to speak. So how do you train these neural networks? Well. Um, Basically, what you want to do is you want to define some loss function, and this is a function that's basically saying like how how bad is the network right now, and um, you so you collect this prediction. This, this is what we'll call y hat. This is what the uh, network predicts for a given point, and then you have your observed variable, and then you basically just uh, define define some kind of loss function. Here is just uh, mean squared error. Um, you just, it's just the, the mean of all the squared errors of, of all of the, uh, between all the observed and the uh, predicted. But um, there are other possibilities too um, that you could use. And then the idea is you want to, you, you run this, these like gradient descent approaches, which I'm not going to get into the, the math behind it, um, also because you don't need to know it, because that's one of the benefits of TensorFlow. Um, but um, it, the basic idea is that you, uh, update the weights according to their contribution to the error. Um, and so you're sort of like descending down this error curve by picking better and better weights as time goes on. Um, and there, there's just so much literature about like how to optimize and how to, um, and, and all these different al algorithms and all these different optimizers that you could use. Um, but that's the basic idea for a lot of these. Let's get into code. Um, that's just a bunch of imports. Okay. So um, we're going to use we're uh, we're going to run through an example using that hand um, handwriting analysis or hand not handwriting analysis <laughs> uh, handwriting recognition um, data set that I described before. Uh, so I'm going to load in data from Scikit Learn because it's it's in there, and um, and so here I am just loading it in, and then I am the only the only thing I'm going to do to change it is um, I'm going to call I'm going to use pandas and I'm going to I'm going to get the the dummy variables out of here. So instead of beforehand, um, it was it was just like the the, the y variable is just um, a list of integers from zero to nine, and I'm saying I want to transform that into that a matrix of with ten columns that's just binary and it's one if if um, if, if that's the case, so, so if, if, it's, if this particular sample is three, then the third index would have, be one and everything else would be zero. That's all I'm doing there. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, let's run this. Um, so as you can see, there's, 
seven, uh, about 1,800 samples, um, 64 columns. So there's about 64 pixels in each of the images. Um, and then, I, and like I said, this output matrix is like the 1,800 by 10. Um, and here are some samples of what they look like. So very, very low res, but um, yeah, you can kind of see that they're just grayscaled and um, each pixel has a value um, that's uh, zero to 255 that's um, describes the intensity at that um, at that spot. Uh, so let's get into TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is an open source um, library by Google that um, to build a lot of these models. Um, and one of the really cool things about it is that it's um, it's kind of like Theano if you've ever played with that. It's like symbolic, so you can just tell it the um, tell it the equations rather and rather than like actually computing the thing on the data you just tell it what equations you expect and then it can it and then say run off off this data and it'll plug it in and, and run this and that that's really useful for computing gradients like we were talking about before um uh to training these these networks we don't even have to worry about that we just have to worry about how to specify the network and then say update it um so oh sorry that's so this is yelling at me because i already have a session open but you create um a session in TensorFlow, and then that's what you run all of these operations on. Um, and basically, yeah, so a session uh, creates these, this computation graph that um, describes all of these operations, um, and then you can kind of just say run it. So let's get into, uh, let's get into some of this. So in TensorFlow, um, you want to define all of your inputs as um, variables here. And so um, I'm, I'm defining the input and the output as placeholder variables. Um, and I, I know I happen to know the shape ahead of time, right? So I, or I, I know the shape of the data, 64 dimensions, right, for the input, 10 for the output. And then I put none here because um, that's basically just saying um, I don't care how many samples I have. So like later down the road, if I want to plug in a, a subset of this data set, um, that's fine. Um, obviously the number of like dimensions needs to be fixed, but um, that's what that none means. It, it allows you for like batching and things like that if you want to do that. Um, here is the network right here. We're just going to define the computation for the network. This is actually a network with no hidden layers. Um, we'll add the hidden layer in a second, but basically we define this weight matrix, and um, this is the weight matrix going from the input to the next layer, which in our case is the output, so we know the size of that. Um, and then there's also a bias unit, so if you think of like you know a linear regression, like y equals mx plus b, this is the b, um, and that's usually you know needed in a lot of these, right? And then um, here is the equation for the for the network. So um, we're doing a matrix multiply on the input and the weight matrix, adding in the bias, and then passing that all through a uh, softmax function, which I haven't described softmax, but it's just um, it's another type of, of um, uh, activation function that that basically allows um, you to see probabilities across many different choices. And um, so this is actually since there's no hidden layer, this is actually um, pretty much equivalent to like logistic regression, if you're familiar with that, or softmax regression, I guess technically, um, because it's really the hidden layer on the neural network that actually makes it neural networky. Um, but this, so anyway, so what we're doing here is we're just setting this variable y hat to be the output of these inputs. And notice we have not given it any data yet at all. Um, we're just describing how it would work. Um, then we define our loss function. I'm just going to use mean squared error loss. Um, so just the square of the difference between y hat, which is our prediction out of the network, and um, y underscore, which is this placeholder that, I, that I'm using for the actual output. Um, just square it, um, and then just take the mean of that. Uh, I'm also going to define some functions here to if I want to know like how well the, the network is doing. Um, so this is just computing the accuracy. So um, we're um, taking the argmax, so since softmax, basically, um, since the output's going to be like 10 numbers for each sample, I just want to pick the one that has the highest probability. So um, I'm passing that through argmax here, and, and we're basically saying, um, are, is my predicted choice equal to the actual observed choice? And then um, taking the mean of that um, would give us the accuracy. 
Then at the very end here, I am saying, um, I'm saying, I'm saying, okay, let's take the let's let's pick an optimizer to use. So I'm using this Atom optimizer. There's other there's a gradient descent optimizer. There's an Eta grad. These are just like different algorithms, uh, different optimization algorithms, um, and you give it a learning rate. So this is this is basically like how steep you want to descend down this curve. So because a lot of these a lot of these error curves are not like just smooth at all. They're pretty bumpy, and so um, you can overshoot if you have a really high um, learning rate. And so you got to you get or you can or it'll take forever to train if you have a really low learning rate. So that's this is a uh, parameter that is something that the, the, the program has to take into account. And um, we're just saying, okay, um, give us this optimizer with these parameters and just minimize this error. And, and so this error is a, is a function of this y hat, which in the, here's, here's the um, equation for that, right? And so it kind of follows it backwards and, and it can update and it basically it, it updates the weights such that it minimizes this error. Um, and then at the very end, I'm just saying, initialize all these variables. I'm telling, I'm, I'm saying session run initialize the variable. So like I said, you run all these things on the session, and you just, I just I'm just telling you to initialize it all. Um, okay, and now let's actually get into training it. So I'm gonna run, uh, just, a, I'm just gonna go through 1,500 of these training iterations, and I'm just gonna say, um, this is what I defined up here, right? This optimizer, and I'm just gonna say run, and I'm gonna feed it. Um, you have to give, you have to feed it, you have to tell it what data it expects, um, right? So um, remember, so um, basically any of these variables you could pass in as, as something, right? Or any of these placeholders you can pass in as something. And so here I'm saying, okay, for, for every time you see X, actually give it the actual data we're talking about. Every time you see Y, give it the actual data we're talking about. Uh, and then I'm just gonna print every 100 Iterations. I'm just going to print the um, accuracy. Um, so we're, you know, we're doing okay, I guess. 77% um, accuracy is is not bad, I guess. But you know, if you hired someone who couldn't recognize handwriting 77 or 33% of the time, what are you doing with your life? Um, <laughs> so let's add a hidden layer to this. Um, and the way so the uh, I'm so what the way you do that basically is um, we're just going to create two weight matrices now and two bias units and um, and then define the equation in two steps basically um, you don't you can you know name them whatever you want I'm being extremely explicit right now and verbose but um, here's the weight matrix going from the input to the hidden units. Um, I'm now initializing it to some, before I was initializing it to zero, now I'm initializing it to these random variables. Um, but other than that, there's nothing, nothing too crazy here. Um, and then here's the, um, the weight matrices from the hidden to the output, same with the biases. Um, and then here is, I'm defining the um, activation through, like up to the hidden unit. So this is the, uh, multiplying, multiplying the input by that first weight matrix, adding the bias, passing it through a sigmoid activation function. Then I'm just taking that, multiplying it by the second weight matrix, adding in that bias, and passing through a softmax, softmax activation function. Uh, the rest of this code is the same. I, I do have to redefine it with all these new um, changes, but um, the rest of the code is the same, and now we have a hidden layer that is doing better. It's a little bit slower to train a lot of times, um, just because there's a lot more parameters to, to train on, but 95% um, is much better. I mean, we, we could definitely improve that even further, but um, that's good enough, I think, for <laughs> to start. Um, so I, I want to give like a sense of like, an intuition behind the hidden layers of these neural networks. So here's like a, a toy data set uh, from Scikit-Learn. It's basically just um, um, an inner circle surrounded by this outer circle, and then the inner circle is its own class, and the outer circle is its own class. And the task uh, is to find is to be able to, to, to approximate this function to be able to separate the two. So a human looking at that would be okay. Just put a circle in between that, and then you're good. Um, we'll see if the neural network could do that. Um, basically, I just took all this code and turned it into a couple of functions here, um, but it does most of the same thing, and then. Um, and then I had and I added some code to, to uh, plot as it trains. So this is no hidden layers. Um, it's having a real tough time. 
It's it's so no hidden layers. Remember, is basically um, it's trying to find a linear function. So it's trying to find a line that could separate that could that could separate these. Um, it's kind of like a mean thing to ask it, right? Because it's it's not going to be able to find it. Um, now, if we add in the hidden layer, it's it's actually able to find it. So it's so it, the hidden layer actually allows allows it to kind of like find this this kernel in in math terms is called a kernel and it, and it kind of just like finds the shape of this kernel um, and and it's able to eventually uh, learn that. So um, starting to run out of time, but um, really quickly here are some other features of TensorFlow. Um, they have GPU computing built in um, right out of the box. You don't really have to. You just have to specify. You have to, you have to set it up, but you don't really have to specify um, anything else. You don't have to change anything else in your code. Also, cluster computing they released pretty soon or pretty recently. Um, I personally haven't messed around with it, but um, it's again it, you don't even have to think about it. It it run it it figures out how to how to um, how to parallelize all these operations and. Um, you just have to obviously set up the cluster and everything. Um, and then this notebook is on my GitHub. Um, my username is mcraig2. I don't know who took mcraig, but. Um, <laughs> and then, the, and then uh, my, uh, in, in the Py, PyGotham uh, talk repo, I have my code. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sure, it is. It is a lot of trial and error, um, and it does depend uh, project to project. Um, so basically, one way to think about the, yeah, these hidden layers is like um, it, it's it's um, it, if your hidden layer is smaller than your input layer, then you're basically asking the network to reduce in dimensionality your input. Um, and if it's and and so if um, if your problem is set up in such a way that you think that that's like you're, you, that, that it's okay to do, it's like you you're not worried about it being that lossy, um, then then that's uh, fine. Usually, if when I'm when I'm trying these out, um, there's definitely no one number, but um, I I try to go anywhere between like two thirds of the number of in input dimensions to two times, and then just kind of um, see uh, performance wise like how how it works. Um, the, I mean, you can also add in many, many hidden layers too. I mean, all, all that, all this stuff. But um, I usually try to start pretty simple, one hidden layer, and then, yeah. Uh, do, so, do you have experience with other deep learning frameworks? And if so, can you speak to the performance differences? Um, yeah. So, uh, TensorFlow was did come under fire pretty uh, at the beginning because it was not uh, as performant as some of the other ones. Um, um, but I think it's better now. I have messed around, like, so I've, I've messed around with Yano and um, it's pretty performant. Um, I've messed around with um, Cafe um, and and some other ones. And it, I, I just personally prefer the um, the interface for, for this. Um, I'm also, like, I, I don't, I'm not running ginormous networks, so I'm, I'm, I'm not um, too concerned about uh, performance, but, um, it's definitely, um, it's definitely uh, like TensorFlow is definitely um, fast now, <laughs> if that makes sense compared to the other ones. Uh, have you seen, uh, just following up on that first question, have you seen any examples of using gradient descent on the parameters? So like how you're saying, you know, training the different network sizes, like, because um, I've been having trouble finding like specifically gradient descent on the parameters and then training that off of the network so that you don't have to self tune. Grading descent on like how many? Yeah, have you seen any units? examples of that with TensorFlow? So I've seen it in, you know. this, um, like this, 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 the whole field called like hyperparameter optimization. And yeah, and yeah, and um, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't personally used that. I, I think that there's, a, it, there's a lot of like. Um, there are there are a couple other ways you can do that. I mean, there's there's like a grid search type of approach where you just try a bunch and then pick the one that has the best. There's like a ran just a random search actually turns out to be pretty better, even better sometimes than um, grid search. Uh, but running gradient descent on those hyperparameters, I don't personally have experience with. But um, 
it, it could it could be something interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you.